Yo, what's going on, everybody? It's your boy Northside Plow with Pop One Podcast coming to you guys and talking about our newest sponsors, Dueling Guard. Yes, Dueling Guard, your one stop shop for all your TCG accessories. They got the deck boxes, the play mats, the binders, and soon to come card sleeves. Yes, they're doing it all. And I'm going to tell you guys right now the quality of this stuff is out of this world. I really advise you guys to go check them out. And if you want to pick something up for your friends for the holidays at checkout, make sure you use code POP1 for your 5% discount. Discount. That's code POP1, P-O-P, and the number one. You get 5% off, and I'm going to tell you guys, walking around with this stuff, you're going to be the top of your locals. You're going to be the top of these big tournaments. You're going to really look nice. I'm looking at all this stuff. They just dropped their new three captains anime art cards play mat and deck box combo. You want to go get that before it sells out. It is insane. Your favorite pirates on your favorite deck box. Got to love it. Use code POP1 for your discount. That's again, DuelingGuard.com. Very cool people. Down to earth owners too. Got to sit down and talk on the phone with those guys. I I got a feeling this is going to be a really good journey. So you guys go check them out. Let's get back into the podcast. If you go into a tournament, you've seen people in that room with the black shirt on that says the word judge on it. You may ask yourself, is it hard to be a judge? What does it take to to become a judge? Well, ladies and gentlemen, today we have a very special guest. We have a man who many years ago decided to go down that journey himself from player to judge. He spent many years working his way up, becoming a good regional level judge, and then eventually being able to become a YCS level judge. This person has experienced all the different aspects of what it means to be a judge, whether it's working side events, whether it's working deck checking, whether it's working admin, whatever the case may be, this man has done it. If you've ever wondered what it's like to be a judge at a YCS event or a regional, you're definitely going to pay attention to this episode. Please help me in welcoming Mr. Kyrie Nock. What's up, Barry? How's it going, man? So tell us, uh, I like to ask every guest that comes on to this podcast, what got you into Yu-Gi-Oh? Oh, man, I've been, uh, I grew up with Yu-Gi-Oh. You know, um, I, I'd say Pokemon got me into Yu-Gi-Oh, you know, regular TV and everything. Uh, I remember when Yu-Gi-Oh first came out in 2001. Um, actually, a weird fun fact that nobody knows or a lot of people don't remember is Yu-Gi-Oh was actually supposed to premiere on TV. September 15, 2001. I did not and it got that. pushed back two weeks. Did yeah, really? I was I was I was sad. I was sad about it. And I live, you know, I'm from New Jersey. So, um, you know, the when the towers fell, it was right up the street. And, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh became kind of a, a coping mechanism for that for me. And then not only that, I just I just liked anime. So it, it kind of became a, a, a thing. I remember getting, you know, some of the earliest Yu-Gi-Oh stuff, the starter deck, uh, Yu-Gi's, and I remember pulling Wing Weavers, and we didn't have money for Blue Eyes, so yeah, we just kind of had fun with those. We didn't know the rules. We playing like Duelist Kingdom, Half Magic. Um, getting into Yu-Gi-Oh was um, it it was just a childhood thing, really, and um, I'm still here. So uh, you were like a child, child when all this happened, huh? I was 11 years old. I had just turned 11. Wow. That's... Yeah, I'm, I'm 33 now. I'm old. <laughs> I want to say all that. Oh, shoot. I turned 30 in April. Um, you know, you 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 were kind of older back then, then, huh? Back then, what type of uh, locals experience did you have? You know, a lot of people would talk about, like, the Toys R Us, um, the books and millions that they would go to to play. Um, what did you do? Like, what was your first locals experience? My first locals experience wasn't until I was an adult. And um, the reason why is because where I was at, the I, what I will say is um, New Jersey, specifically where I was at, 
it wasn't a Yu-Gi-Oh playing scene, but they did sell cards and everything like that. So friends I knew growing up, growing up, um, neighbors and stuff like that. Sometimes I see a neighbor. Uh, actually, that's how I met one of my friends. He was my next door neighbor. I was walking to the backyard and him and his cousin was playing Yu-Gi-Oh in the backyard. And that's how I got introduced to them. Uh, one of my best friends, we've been best friends for our, almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years in 2025. Um, he used to play, he played Yu-Gi-Oh, but you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, com you know, competitive back then or anything like that. So my connection with the game as a teenager was more of uh, playing against friends. So I didn't get a local scene until I joined the military and it was just, this is how people play. And I had to start kind of, you know, uh, fitting into that scene. It's fascinating you say that. Um, I know a lot of players who are in the military. Uh, did it surprise you joining the army, finding how many uh, of your fellow soldiers were actually Yu-Gi-Oh players? It did. It it surprised me so well, so much. Um, when I first when I first got the advanced individual training, um, I got stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington State, and. Um, you know, back then, Shonen Jump used to still put Yu-Gi-Oh cards in the magazines. I think uh, Cameratech Overdragon just came out mm -hmm. in the Shonen Jump. And I remember, you know, getting it and everything. And I go into the post exchange. The post exchange is basically like uh, the Army's version of Walmart. I go in there and they have a shop that's a card shop. And I'm just surprised. And I was, I was, I was actually astonished. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. And he was like, yeah, and we have tournaments every Sunday. And I said, whoa. So that was my first experience with it, um, with with playing, sorry, with learning that there was a locals or even the thing was even a thing. I, I thought all tournaments were just big tournaments because that's just how TV and media just made it pre uh, perceived to me. So um, my first locals, I was nervous. I won't lie to you. I was nervous. I didn't know... Um, fully what to do. There were players who were very competitive and or smarter on certain things, and I just wasn't there. Um, for instance, I didn't know you could activate MST from your hand during your end phase. I was just like, wow. Like, like little simple stuff like that blew my mind. And um, I just learned and progressed from there. Um, I, I chilled for a little bit after my first, after my first few locals because... Um, I was with 2nd Infantry Division, and we went to Iraq. And when I got back from Iraq, that's actually when I met one of my – one of, um, I met a very close friend. And he taught me how to really – competitively. It, from there, it was – can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, sorry. My headphones just acted weird. Um, but, yeah, so my um, – my, he taught me how to play Yu-Gi-Oh! competitively, how to – chain cards and you know summon and what to look for how to deck build and everything um my first successful deck was just very counterintuitive and that's when i found my niche a lot of players they like to you know see what's what's hot in the meta and they'll like to play that and my niche was playing against the meta you know by playing cards that nobody really knew how to how to deal with the first deck I won a tournament with was called Macro Sworn. It was ma it was a mix of Macro Cosmos and Light Sworn, and it sounds stupid on paper, but it worked because I would mill everything and banish everything, and then I would Miracle Dig Burial from a different dimension, put everything back in a grave, and just taught me how teching cards and understanding how a deck moves can make you a better player, and I just evolved from there. That's that's. That's honestly like a super fascinating like background. I gotta tell you, I didn't know that uh, bases actually had local card shops. Um, is that something they still have? Um, it just depends. So the bases, um, the bases can have stores, kind of like how um, you ever walk into a Walmart and they have like Subway, McDonald's, the people yeah. that cut hair. Yeah, it's kind of like that. That's really fascinating. Um, so going back to your journey as a player, that was your experience as a local, um, you know, going to locals. How did that evolve? At what point, um, 
in your journey as a player did you become okay it's time for me to start going to regionals and how did you perform at regionals and what did it take to help step your game up it took a lot it took a lot longer than that um i didn't go to my first regionals until after i got back from wait uh i'm sorry i'm trying to no i did go i didn't go for a while though um i went right before i went to afghanistan but I went a lot more after I got back from Afghanistan. Um, so my journey just kind of continued. I just kept evolving, kept growing. I was learning how to proxy cards, learning how to play cards. And I just got better and better and better in myself. And when I went to Afghanistan, instead of doing what I did when I went to Iraq, when I went to Iraq, I just completely stopped and fell off. Right. I would keep up with the news and that was it. When I was in Afghanistan, we had things like dueling book or, well, dueling network back then and ed and Yu-Gi-Oh pro and stuff like that so i was testing i'm play testing cards as they coming out i know how to play against dragon rulers as they're coming out i'm playing with medulches i'm learning trap tricks i'm learning harpies all this other stuff so when i came back we're hitting the regional scene strong to where we're um we're just learning and we're evolving and evolving and we're doing better at at tournaments now, what transitioned me to a judge was after Afghanistan, you know, while I'm still playing, I want to learn more. I want to learn more. And I had a good friend, TN, um, lives in Washington. He um, he was our local judge. He was our local judge. Sometimes I'd see him judge regional. I had a friend, Darnell. He would judge regionals, too. And I would just see the knowledge that they had on these cards and the text and everything. And I just I got curious about it. But unfortunately, the the Seattle judging game was kind of crowded, so I couldn't squeeze into it. So I had to wait until I um, till I uh, PCS'd from Fort Lewis to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Once I got there, I played it. I played one regional, and at that regional, I walked up to the head judge and I said, "Hey, how can I start judging for you um, the next event?" He told me to contact the store. I contact the store, and you know they got everything situated with me. And I was there, my my first regional judging it, uh, Nashville, Shadal format, the very beginning of Shadal format, when they only had Construct and Winda. And what was that first event judging? Like, were you nervous? Uh, were you like, like a, I guess, uh, you know, what was that experience like for your first time judging? I was nervous. I, I was nervous because um, what, the thing is, if you've ever, had an experience and I don't I don't say this to talk down on any judges mm -hmm. but if you ever had an experience where a judge gave you a bad call or anything like that you know you know what it feels like and I I felt stuff like that too and I don't want to give that to the next player and that puts a lot of pressure on you but you have to be confident in yourself when you're confident in yourself and you're you know, that means you're reassuring of everything you've read, everything you know. And you go over it, and it's just a simple task. It's just like doing anything else. It's like doing this podcast. You know, you talk to people all the time. You've done this plenty of times. Now I have to reread the rules. No conjunctions. Um, know what, and if you do, or then, know what the semicolon and the colon means. As long as I'm on top of my knowledge, I won't screw a play over like that. And trust me, we don't we don't try to screw players over or anything like that. Judges are humans too. We make mistakes, and all that is going through my head as I'm taking my first event. But it went very smooth. It went very smooth to where um, so the the head judge I worked for was John Rocha. If you've been playing for a while, you probably know who he is. And uh, I judged for him for two years straight until I left Fort Campbell. So. He, he always, you know, taught me more. He taught me how to be a better judge. And it, it, a lot of it comes down to organization. Um, you know, being able to take things like when we take, when, when you come to public events and there's a judge in between like a table, he usually has like three tables. And he's running like anywhere from four to eight tournaments. And they taught me that kind of organization and being able to de-escalate situations between players and things like that. So, you know, from my first event being unsure that I could do that to doing that and now being able to fully control that, that first event was everything. And it taught me all of that. But now it's just 
I'm so used to it. We're good. That's crazy. Um, you know, I hear a lot uh, with these YCS judges. So you're a YCS judge now. You judge a lot of YCSs. I, I know I met you out in Vegas last year. Um, mm -hmm. How did you become a YCS judge? Because I know uh, a lot of players, uh, a lot of judges, I should say, they apply to be judges, but they're not local to where the YCS is, so they don't get the approval. How how did you actually transition from being someone who did regionals to now doing a YCS level event? So um, what I did was, like I said, I did regional judging for two years mm -hmm. straight um, from 2000. 14 to 2016 and that was the first time i applied i got shot down too i remember i had i had about four i had about five or six under my belt i applied and got denied and then when i got 10 under my belt i applied again i got accepted and um what players what players have to understand is the perception of judging and the actual judging are two different things we're not some power hungry smart aleck group we are pillars of the community we're trying to make sure the game moves smoothly smoothly and that's what your job should be when you apply and a lot of the times um people people apply they haven't even been judging their locals or they they don't read their certain things or they're not even taking their rc test or anything like that and sometimes and sometimes um people give it away that they're not even qualified to be judges. You see a lot of judges who don't even read the cards. You have to read the cards. And even if I'm sure of a card, I could play that card 2000 times and I will still pick it up when a player asks a question about it. And I will read every little thing. You have to be meticulous on that type of stuff. And a lot of the times judges just don't have it because the, the thing is what, what people have to understand too is, um, this, this whole tournament scene is, besides it being a game, it's also a business. And you have to make sure that you can present yourself reliable. You're selling yourself just like you would do applying for a job. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to work. We're here to work for the community. And you have to be able to sell yourself as a good judge. Um, good judge of character, a good judge of the game, and have excellent customer service. When we ask when you put in that application and it says, what is your judging experience? We don't necessarily care about the events. And this is the secret. We don't necessarily care about the events. We care about the positions you, you've played and what you've done. Have you done deck checks before? Have you given rulings before? Were you just the guy at the register? We need to know what you've done. That's the experience we want to know, not just... Oh, I judge locals. I mean, yeah, that's cool that you judge locals, but you know, you ever you ever try to take a deck to see if it's the cards are marked, you know, things like that. And and that's a lot of the times we we check for the experience, but also there are so many judges in the judge program that we need to make sure you have some kind of experience. So don't be applying for uh, applying for big events. If you haven't done small events, you got to get the small events out the way because I can tell you, a YCS is way different than a, than a WCQ. A WCQ is way different than a regional. They're all different from each other. Even the the big events, uh, the big events dif differ from each other as well in so many different ways. I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, a YCS is harder than a, in a WCQ. Uh, sorry, in a WCQ, YCSs are harder. I could definitely understand how that would happen. Uh, you were talking about the different jobs uh, that goes in being a judge. What what are those different jobs? I know a lot of people are saying what those are. Well, because um, most of the time you have people who, especially if you judge locals, you think that all the judging we do is just floor judging. But sometimes you got to be a live stream judge. When you're a live stream judge, it's a whole lot of different pressure on you. It's pressure on the players, too. Um, but not in a bad way, just more on a you have to do things proper. You can't come with that mindset that we do this at locals, so it's okay. This is a YCS. This is a, this is a, um, a world champion qualifier. You have to be more professional. And so you'll, you'll be stretched out to a few different jobs. You might have to work public events where you might have to manage tournaments. You know, you might have to 
um, be a floor judge. You might have to be the live stream judge. Um, and it's more than just the rulings. It's about the procedure of how you handle your task and how you uh, talk to the players and how you manage the players. If I have two players and they're starting to get loud, like they're about to start arguing, mm -hmm. I got to de-escalate the situation because that can disrupt our entire tournament. And that's not to say all players are just these angry people or anything like that. But as a judge, like I said, we're, we're pillars of the community. We're pillars of the game. So we have to make sure that everything is running as smooth as we can. We're kind of like your public servants in a way. Um, we want to make sure everything is taken care of and everyone is taken care of. And that's another part of it. That's why when you see us at YCS, we're going by. We're picking up trash. We're pushing in chairs. We, we don't want you to, you know, you got your... $500 SP little night <laughs> and now she's sitting in a wet spot No, you definitely because it, it, exactly or like you know a player wasn't the chair is all the way out because the chair is broken and then now you sitting in a chair and you falling out of the chair or anything like that or there's trash on the floor and you know a lot of a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh players we meet are grown are grown, got kids and stuff like that. You don't want your son slipping on a pack that you find randomly, picking up trash. So we pick up some of the trash, we tidy up the area because we we want to make it you know more pres uh, presentable to the player. We want to make sure it looks nice. We want to make sure you're taken care of. And also when it comes to you know other roles, sometimes we might have to help Konami staff with something. Um, Sometimes we might have to just do line duty, keeping players in line or keeping things organized. Almost anything that is not selling cards at the event, we do. It's almost like you're a brand ambassador for Konami, essentially, for, for these tournaments. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you know, they they this is probably no secret, and any judge can tell you they tell us, you know, when you look at when we look at our uniforms. We have Konami on it. So when we wear those, we represent Konami. And um, it's it's more than just that. That's the business side of it. But it also says Yu-Gi-Oh on it. When, you, when, it, when it comes to Yu-Gi-Oh, that's the community. Mm -hmm. So we represent the community. We represent the community and the business model. And um, that's that's who we fight for. We work for Konami and we, we work for y'all as well. And um, we, we got to take care of both. Yeah, one of the most important things is what the judges do for these events. You know, uh, one thing that a lot of people don't love about the game, obviously, you know, are the time rules. But I remember once upon a time, time rules weren't what they are now, and events were going forever and ever and ever. And you being a judge, uh, part of your job is ensuring that the events are going fast, smooth, um, and fair for everyone in the entire room. What do you think the impact of changing the time rule has really done for the game? The time rules have changed the game, and I'm going to tell you exactly why. So um, I played on a competitive level um, since what format, I would say, um, since maybe before 6 Sam format, like literally like 2010, 11. I remember Tour Guide just coming out and all that. Um, so I've been around for the old time rules and the new one. I've judged in the old time rules and I've played in it. And I've done the same with the new one as well. And um, a lot of players do complain about it. But in a way, it did change the game because back in the day, we weren't running burn cards. We were not running burn cards. We weren't running life point gain cards. The only one that counted was like Cowboy. That's it. Other than that, all those cards that Konami make that says, you know, inflict 300, gain 1,000, it does this. You know, uh, what's it called? Ghost Sister, Spooky Dogwood, yeah. cards like Firecracker. Firecracker is a hand trap that most people don't even know. You skip your next draw phase, but you burn your opponent for 1,000. Like, if you draw that before on turn zero before you go and your opponent is setting up their board, they could cowboy you. All right, cool. Firecracker, you lose. And... When we used to have turns, I would see there would literally be a duplicate round, technically. Like I I remember watching I remember watching a Burning Abyss mirror match and it was forty five minutes. I had to sit there at that table for forty five minutes 
They were 45 minutes into time, which the rounds were 40 minutes back then. So that was technically two rounds worth of time just because we weren't going into time. These new time rules, it saves it's, it saves everybody a lot of time um, physically for themselves. We're leaving events early, mm-hmm. earlier than what we, what we would. I would see regionals would be ending 1130 at night. And then you got judges that got to drive three hours. You got players that got to drive two and three hours and everything like that. So we're just knocking down that time to make it more uh, savable for everyone, especially with, you know, a lot of us getting older. We want to go to bed early. We got kids. They want to, we got to get them in the house. You know, I don't know if you got kids, but can you imagine bringing your kids home at almost one, two in the morning from a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament? No, I couldn't. (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, things like that. And then um, not only that, Konami now pays us. So the longer we take, the more that they have to pay us. That's on the business side of things. But also very long times demotivate players. Players, when when you, when you're in, let's say you're round, let's say it's round four, right? It's round four. You just won your match. There's seven minutes left on the clock. You know, probably within seven, another maybe ten minutes after that expires, the next round is probably going to start queuing up. But could you imagine that seven minutes? Um, you you end the round. I'm sorry, you end your game. There's seven minutes left, and then now the next round isn't starting for another hour. It feels like some of the big events, though, like that's still the case uh, for the first couple rounds. I, I remember nationals last year. It took an hour between the first. I want to say three rounds before. Um, the next round would start. It felt like it. It could. The thing is, the the thing is about that is like you'll still get times where you know things like that will occur, mm-hmm. um, and that's out of our that's partially out of our control. But we're trying to do the best we can, you know, to make it better. But um, I'd rather I'd rather have it occur that little bit of time yes. versus you know day. very current. I've I've been to events where. Where we literally do not end at until you know round nine is at midnight, mm-hmm. eleven, you know things like that. That's too late. This is this is marketed as a children's card game, so I don't want children up that late. How do you feel about that? Is that okay to talk about? Uh, you know, because I feel like whenever we go to these tournaments, majority of the room is, you know, millennials, late twenties, early thirties, maybe young twenties, and you look at Dragon Duelist, and there's like four or five of them. Um, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, that's just the market of what's, of what's around. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said, I didn't play my first locals until I was an adult. It could be the same thing for these kids. And, um, that's, that's one thing that I do like about the Yu-Gi-Oh community is that most of us are here because it was just an escape. Right. So that's why a lot of us are still here. And it's like, that's what you found comfort in as a child, as a teenager, and you're still doing it as an adult. And it's like this, it's like a passion. It's like a, sorry, it's a coping mechanism that became a passion. And it's, it's something that you love. That's why you, that's why you have a lot of judges, you know, that judge so they can give back. Right. Even if, even if it's all adults now, it could be all adults. That's fine. It's the community that's that's a part of it because you look at if you if you look at some of the judges or even some of the Konami staff, they've been around for a long time. Um, I started talking to some of the Konami staff. These are former SC, SJC champions, YCS champions. I worked for, I worked with Billy Brake for a whole year. I didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know. Like they just, one of the best one of the best Yu Gi Oh champions we've ever had. And I'm working with him like um, Julia, Julia, you know, shout out to Julia. She's the head of the judge program. She was a top player back in the day. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of staff that turn championships into careers right. um, from this. And there's a lot of people who say, you know what? Yu-Gi-Oh is why I travel. Um, I, I would have had no reason to really go to Vegas if. I didn't, and I'm a, I'm a world traveler. I love to travel. I love to go places, and that is one part that actually helps me, helps motivate me to travel. It's like, oh, we're doing a YCS here. All right, let's go. 
you know, we'll knock this off the travel bucket list. We'll we'll have some fun with it. Um, so, you know, they they have the same kind of they kind of have the same background as most players. Like they they've been doing this for a long time, and you know they're they're they were adults when they started. Or yeah, actually, yeah, you got to be eighteen to judge. So yeah, they were adults when they started almost twenty years ago. Now we're the adults, and we're probably going to still be doing this, continuing this. And those little kids that, that those four or five that you see for Dragon Duels, they're probably going to be continuing it too. I think they will. Um, look at someone like Jesse Cotton. He was a Dragon Duelist, and now he's one of the best players ever. Yeah. Yeah. The, shout out to Jesse. Oh, my gosh. Like, yeah. <laughs> that man is skilled. <laughs> I wish they have a fraction of that man's skill one day. <laughs> so you've been judging for a long time now. What would you say is uh, some of your favorite memories or your favorite moments from judging? I don't want this to sound bad. It don't won't. worry. You don't have to edit this part out. <laughs> but sometimes I'll, uh, sometimes like when, when players like make bad judgment calls on like text and I just be like, oof. like, uh, I remember, that Wonder Wand, you equip to a spellcaster and you could send it you could send it and the spellcaster to draw two? Um I don't know if it's Wonder Wand, but I know exactly what you're talking about, the equip spell. Yeah, yep, it is Wonder Wand, because they have Wonder Wand and One Shot Wand. But Wonder Wand is the one that you draw to. Uh I seen somebody do that with Shadal Dragon and they thought they got the pop and it's like, no, you don't. Um because it's sense. <laughs> And honestly, honestly, one of my, my one of my favorite things is I like to see when I like to see when my friends uh, do really well at tournaments. Um, I try now me me being me, I try to avoid my friends as much as I can to try to be on a professional level Absolutely. because I don't want I don't want somebody to be like, oh yeah, the judge is helping you, the judge is helping you, but I do help them build their decks like usually before the tournament's going on because the thing is I'm in, I'm judging so many major events regionals and YCSs and stuff um, I can you know I might judge I might judge Hartford Connecticut on a Sunday and then I might come to my friends Wednesday and say hey y'all going to Catskill New York uh Saturday right all right cool look they're playing this they're playing that don't play this this is bad you know stuff like that um, the first weekend Cleeforts came out, I remember I built one of my friend's deck. Um, I built his Cleefort deck and he went 3-0 and he went, he went three wins, no losses until he played Patrick Hoban. To be fair, he's pretty good. Uh, yeah, he was pretty good. He was pretty good. I was like, dude, come on now. Like he was, I, I was like, I was so proud because I built that deck, and I'm like, dude, I got you up here with Patrick Hoban and Jeff Jones because uh, we we were in Nashville, so those guys are just right there. And this is at the time when uh, it's just at a peak time, and it's so good to see some upcoming champions now, like um, Chris LeBlanc. Um, wow, Joseph! I forgot Joseph's last name. He was just he just won Richmond and I was sitting right there when he won. And uh actually fun fact, the two finalists at Richmond, they were um that was their both of their first YCSs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it was you know, things like that. I love seeing when like when players who are just like, Look, I just came here to trade cards and have fun start doing great. Start doing great. Sometimes, you know, you see those players at every event. And they're the most prideful and arrogant ones, and it's like, dude, you gotta, you gotta chill on that. You gotta become better, and and that's 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 what you gotta do. I get humbled all the time. I get humbled sometimes. Sometimes, um, sometimes I might mess up a ruling, and you know, when if a person puts in that appeal or a judge tells me later, I'll apologize to that player, and then I I go home and I, I learn more about it. When Fenrir came out, Fenrir came out, and um. Darkwing Blast, that YCS was literally that same weekend. It came out on a Friday, and we had to play with it the next day, and that was the first time we seen a when or if effect. Mm -hmm. I feel like Konami does that a lot, where they'll release an event like the Friday for a YCS uh, SP Little Night, prime example in uh, Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The thing is, I can't, I can't fault them for that, because um, business side, 
they got to sell product. But community side, they want to have events. They want to have events and want to have fun. And um, the way they have to, the way they spread out the events, we have a YCS in North America probably like once every month. Well, I mean, North America, I mean, Canada, the U.S., Mexico, yes, all Central America, too. And, um, you know, they're they're so spread out that sometimes we just got to we just got to have one towards the end of the year. Now, it did surprise me that they had two two weeks apart from each other, um, but I was fine with it. You know, uh, a lot of players said they couldn't go. It was too short notice. And we, we fully understand. But it's a it's a good thing we were able to have that. Um, especially with Christmas time and, you know, other, other holidays coming up, um, players won't get real YCS chances during November, December, January, because the money's gone. The money's gone. The family is tied up. Everything is just so tied in. So I actually, I actually, um, got to give props to Konami for being able to say, you know what, we're going to throw two events we know one of them. You have your expensive cards that you gotta you gotta have for your SP Little Knights, your Dia Bell Stars, with your one hundred and twenty dollar wanted or whatever. And like we're just gonna throw another event so that way, you know, if I spend if I spend seven hundred dollars for some cards, I'm playing in some tournaments. Same. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny you're saying that. It, it kind of it's kind of making sense in my head as you're saying that. Tell me if this is like actual business model. Um, like there's no YCSs in December, obviously, you know, money's tight, everything of that nature. But the YCSs don't start back up until February. <laughs> Is that on purpose? Yeah, February, you? February, by February, you, you recover some money by then. Um, <laughs> but that's not, that's not a confirmation of their business model. I am not a Konami employee, <laughs> uh, Konami. So I don't, I don't know, but I, I do have, I do have my own business. Um, and I kind of know. And also, not only that, being a being just a person who has like friends and family, you already know. You know, you get those calls sometimes during January, like, "Hey, bro, you got like fifty dollars I could use for my electric bill." Mm -hmm. He was balling out on Christmas. I already know, but I got you. Mm -hmm. Um, And that that affects a lot of people. And that's not to downplay anybody or nothing like that. Sometimes, you know, I used to be in situations like that, and I know a lot of people that used to be in situations like that. And Konami can can feel that as well. Their employees, they need time off. You got, you know, you got to think of cards and products and everything like that. If we add up, if we add up how many cards Konami has to make every year, it's like two cards a day. If you think about it, our TCG sets are what, 100 cards? You times that by four a year, that's 400 cards. That's more than a card a day. And do you feel like you have to keep up with uh, just about every car? Like, as a judge, what's, what's your, like, process of keeping up with all the different cars so you're not surprised with any ruling questions? So I, I've done it I've done it two ways. Um, the first time is when I when I was I was a really, really, really active player. Like, um, I'd play – we'd play on Sundays. We'd play on Saturdays. We'd play on Thursdays. We'd play on Tuesdays where it's just like we got two or three days a week where we're not playing Yu-Gi-Oh! And it was just being part of being in the game. And then I've done it where I'm just judging, but I'm not playing. And let me tell you, that's the worst of it. And that actually goes into another thing. Um, you can, when, you, when you start to get the aspect of the, the, you know, the other person, if you're the judge and you have the aspect of the player – then you know more than just being the judge. And if you're the player and you just have the aspect of the player, you won't know as much unless you get the aspect of a judge because you have to be able to look at everything from um, from the different views. And it'll always make you better. And that's actually how I keep up. It's just like, it's just like I don't know if you like food, like how I like food, but I also like to cook too. So I'm the food taster and I'm the cooker as well. So I can get the concept of everything. And that's how I, that's how I stay up with knowing the rulings because I have to still play and I judge as well. So I, I can be on both aspects. I can see what's going on and I can um, control what's going on as the judge. When I'm on the floor and I see, I see something out of line, I intervene. But when I'm the player and I see something out of line, you know, I, I have to wait on the judge, but I already know what's coming and I have to have to play around that. So 
that's that's actually how I stayed how I stayed upon um, stayed up on the rules is just playing. You play and you you stick with the meta, and as you play, you'll hear more about oh yeah, you heard about this tech, oh you heard about this deck, these guys won this, these guys won that. But if you just judge, judging is usually one or two days at most a weekend. You don't really get the aspect of what's going on. So if you want to be a better judge. You got to be a player as well. And if you want to be a better player, you should probably learn how to judge too. Do you, uh, do you find that a lot of your peers who are judges um, are just judging? They don't really play anymore? Or would you say majority of them still play? Majority of them still play. Um, now, on a competitive level, maybe not. Mm-hmm. And also, I've been seeing a lot of, I've been seeing a lot of players um, start sticking to the old formats. And that's fine. That's fine too, um, but it does it does open up the whole the whole thing because um, now that they're doing time wizard formats, you know there there there's an extra thing where it's like judges need to kind of start knowing time wizard rules. Like um, I remember when I was uh, I didn't know Stardust didn't activate when it comes back during the end phase. It just came back. Um, you couldn't oppression it or anything like that. It, it, that's what I was being told when I was when when Edison was happening. I was in Iraq, so I didn't know mu- uh, much of the Edison stuff. So like, it's teaching me now a new thing. And if you were if you're a player, if you were a player or even a judge back then in Edison, now that's valuable. Yeah, what I know is I played my first Edison uh, tournament actually at YCS Vegas. I did not day two. Um, and I remember I had a judge call. It was a, you're gonna judge me for this. I uh, I went uh, gadget gadget. I was playing gadget because it was the only deck I knew how to play. I went attack, and then it said damage calc limiter removal. So my opponent was like, uh, "Do you say damage calc?" I was like, "Yeah, is that not right?" So he calls the judge, and the judge's like, "Hold on, let me look at the rulings." And he's like, "Oh, I gotta look at the rulings from um, Edison format." So there's like different rule books now. Uh, with mm-hmm. these different uh, formats. As a judge, do you have access to like a database that normal players don't have? Um, no, no. Everything we have access to, you guys have access to as well. Um, we have to, you know, you, we usually make our own books or like cheat sheets, and we just share them amongst each other to help help ourselves. Um, but we don't mind giving it out to players as well if they want to get the knowledge or obtain the knowledge. You know, if if players are like, hey, I want to I want to learn how to become a judge, we could teach you. You know, I don't I don't mind teaching you. I, I like seeing um, more players. And, and the, the, the sad truth is we're we're starting to be understaffed in a lot of places because a lot of players just a lot of players want to play. And then a lot of there are a lot of judges who don't judge. But, you know, that, that's fine, too. And that's understandable. We're just understaffed. Um, you'll see regionals of like, 300 people with like five judges. Right. And what I'm noticing too, at every YCS, there are side events uh, where you can do regional flights and they're flying off like crazy, right? Like regional flight 300 or 30, or whatever. Um, and what I'm noticing with these judges is one judge will cover uh, four to five different flights. So essentially the, the one judge is covering like five regionals at a time. It's It's almost insane to me. Yes. Let me tell you something. Um, shout out to any judge who has ever done public events or side events whenever you judged it or whatever, because um, it takes a lot. It, it takes a lot. All of your skills as a judge, as a leader, will be tested on public events. Um, for the 250th at, um, in L.A., I actually volunteered for public events for the entire weekend because I wanted to test it. I, um I have aspirations for the whole judge program for myself. So I really needed to test it. I've been on public events before, you know, like half a Sunday, things like that. I told them I wanted the whole weekend and they, they gave it to me and it's no joke. You'll get tables of, of players. You'll get different tournaments. You know, I remember at one time I had eight different tournaments. I was running a winner mat. I was running a winner mat, uh, two Edison, Two goat formats, um, a structure deck, 
and it was like two other tournaments, and you just bouncing through. You got you're the only judge. You're the one answering judge calls for them. You're the one making sure their round starts, and then not only that, you know, as their round as they they play their opponents and beat their opponents, their rounds end differently, and you just have to kind of like match them up. Let's say it's me, you, um, me, you, and two other guys, right? Me and you play, and um, we I, I, you beat me in ten minutes. And now you have to wait for the other two guys to play. And then once they're done, your round starts. I mean, your your round against the next dude starts. But then let's say there's four more other people, right? Then their round, uh, sorry, the winner of those two matches will start independently. And we just kind of got to wait until the opponents are done. So there's a lot of time control and time management you have to do. And... Also, the the head judge is the public events head, uh, the public events lead. So you have to, you know, any appeals go to him. So it, it gets really, it gets really hard. It gets complicated, but it's all worth it. It teaches you where your weaknesses are, and it puts you really in the dogfight. Would you say that some jobs at a YCS are more fun than others? That is completely subjective, depending on the judge. Um, some play, some judges don't like floor judging. I love floor judging. Put me out there where the players are. Put me where the energy is. Some people, you know, want to be on deck team and just, you know, do deck checks and everything like that. And that's where their specialty or their skill is. Some people like public events. Some people want to go on live stream. The important thing is if you think – judging a major event is just floor judging there are way more jobs for you and you could find your comfort of no matter whatever you're doing for instance if you're like oh i want to you know i'm really good at typing i want to be on a computer you can go to deck team because that's where we log out all the decks and and stuff like that or if you're like you know i'm I'm good on my feet i want to move around i love judging you could be on the floor or maybe you're like i I love judging i want to be on my feet and i want to challenge take you to public events what about uh deck checking is that like a different job too that specific judges do that will be part of the deck team so the deck team not only do they um they log the data for the decks that are being used but they also do the deck checks as well and so it's a completely separate team so that that judge that picks up your deck is not the same one that checks that checks your deck. So no. So let's say, let's say a judge comes to your table, and he's doing a deck check, and the player that you're playing is arguing with that judge. You don't. None of you have to worry about your decks being messed with because it will go to another one. First of all, let me correct that statement a little bit too. No judge is going to do that. We keep our integrity very, very high. But also, as a caveat too. What you should know is the person that will be picking up your deck most likely won't be the person that's going to be going through it or anything like that. So no infractions will be on any kind of um, malice base, and they have no room for that at all. We don't tolerate it, and we don't tolerate it, and we won't be able to do it. It's not possible for us. Yeah, it's definitely something I've noticed, you know, being in the Yu-Gi-Oh community. I don't know how other card games are, but... In this community specifically, what I've noticed is that every judge I've interacted with, yeah, you got some that, you know, more strict than others or or however you want to phrase it. But every single judge I've ever met has had a high integrity. And I'd imagine someone doesn't have that high integrity. They would get cut. Um, You can get dismissed easy. And um, and it's not to say that Konami puts like some kind of strict anything on us. But the thing is, like I said, we are the pillars of that community. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you wouldn't trust a car if they're like, yeah, the axle's a little funny. I don't know. Like, I don't know either. <laughs> I'm about to go get the other car. Right. Um, so we, we, we have to be like that. You do have some judges that are a little bit more strict, and you have some that are very lenient. Um, some judges have less compassion than others, and that's just what it boils down to. I've seen, you know, I've seen judges. I've seen judges let player go, players go on infractions that should, you know, fly under the. I mean, that should, sorry, bring penalties. 
Like a player might curse and they're just like, you know what? It wasn't that loud. It, it wasn't in a bad manner. You know, it, nobody else heard it. I'll let it slide this, this time. And they'll let the, they'll let the player know. And that's compassion. Uh, it might not seem like a lot, but the player could have got penalized for it. But the judge decide, you know, I'm going to make the call. You know, you're, you're fine. You're good. So sometimes, sometimes judges won't call you out for things that other judges will in the same capacity. Now, is that to say that we are, um, we're uncooperative with each other? No, but we just have different levels of compassions. We, we come from different backgrounds. We know different things. We know, like, like I said, we're, ju- we're human too. We make mistakes. We know you guys make mistakes as well. When we have players uh, come on live stream, sometimes they might let a bad word go and that bad word could be heard everywhere. And, that's one reason why we kind of crack down on cursing a little bit more. Um, and you start seeing judges be a little bit more strict on things. And sometimes the strictness of the judge is to help you. I remember I told a player one time that he couldn't use his token as a field center. He put it away. He put it away. And guess what he got? Guess what he got in trouble for later? Using the token as a field center. Because what happens is, right, it says token on it. When you're using it, when you have something that says token on it, it's supposed to represent being a token. His opponent thought it was for his opponent. Like you know how like sometimes you're playing and you and you blank out for a second. Yep. His opponent must have blanked out and forgot the token was being treated as a field center and it misrepresented the game states. It's gotta be tough. It's gotta be tough. It is. It is. It is. And um. You know, just just a little small small thing like that. I'm not gonna say which event or where it was. It could have been locals. Who knows? But you never you never want things like that to happen. That's why, like sometimes I come to a player like, "Hey, you can't have that on the table." And they'll be like, "Well, another judge said, you know, another judge didn't say anything about it." And it was like, "All right, that's cool." But I'm telling you, you can't have that. So just put it away. And that's that's to really help them sometimes. Um, and that's just what we do. We want to make sure the game is fair to everyone and it's nice and safe for everyone as well. So that way, you know, you don't have people winning like that. I've seen you on live streams before. Tell me, is it is that like the preferred job for a lot of judges? Because um, I, I notice a lot of times I see the same judges on the actual live stream tables. Um, how, how does that work? How does someone get to be able to be on live stream, things of that nature? Um, you have to you have to get picked for it. Um, they definitely look around. You know, it's, it's kind of like any job when you do when you work that when you work that weekend when you're judging that weekend you're getting evaluated without you even knowing. You you have mentor judges you can talk to 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 learn uh, deeper. I remember my first went my first mentor judge was um was Pro Winston. Okay, I don't know if you remember him. Um, so that was that was my first mentor judge back in uh, 2016, and um, I remember. Uh, sorry, no, no, I'm trying to remember something else. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I blanked out. What was the question again? Uh, what's the? How how does one get on? Getting selected. Yeah. Right, right. So I got I got selected. Um, I got selected because. We uh we had a little change in the judge team, you know, uh, in the judge team. We had a a long time judge uh, pass away recently. Um, I didn't know that. He used to work. He used to work the the live stream team. Yeah, his name was uh his name was Jim. He he passed away. Wow, I want to say September. I could be wrong, and I do apologize if I'm wrong. But it just it wasn't it wasn't too long ago. Not only that, we had a veteran judge of live stream. Um, not sh- he, he he just he had something uh, personal to do that weekend. So it's like okay, so we'll take the next veteran, you know, and we'll give him a new team, and we'll, he'll train up some more judges, and we'll we'll kind of figure out things from there. And what they do is you always get evaluated, um, whether you're whether you know it or not. And that's what they do. They look for they look for things like compassion, leadership, understanding, you know, who's quick on their toes, who who gains the knowledge quickly, because live stream is a whole different thing. Like, for instance, um, you know, you see people who 
they'll they'll have their decks turned uh, like a 90 degree angle or 45 degree angle or anything like that. The graveyard and the deck place is switched. They put the field center in the, I'm sorry, the field spell in the center and stuff like that. You can't do any of that on live stream. It has to be proper zones, proper placement, announcing cards by full name. Not at my, uh, I, not Ash. You have to say I activate Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. Things like that. So, uh, you know, being being a judge and having to remember that and you still have to watch this one game keep up with the game state make sure the players aren't doing anything illegal or anything like that because this is all for show this is for television if you want to see how how it is you can just go to ycs richmond you'll see sometimes they'll stop just for me to be like hey you know fix the deck or you know, and I have to be on top of that. And I have a, I have a team with me. The live stream judges are behind the scenes watching as well. You know, and then the, the other guys, the card, the card guy and the status guy, they're sitting next to me. They'll, those are judges too. And what what are their jobs specifically? Like, what what's each we, judge on the table's jobs? I guess is the question. So, um, you have the the. The two that are on the table, they are judges, quote unquote, but at that point they are Konami staff. So they are working for Konami. You don't call them judge or anything like that. They are strictly for Konami. Now they will help and assist me, uh, which me, I would be uh, sometimes the table judge, which the table judge's job is to judge that one game, make sure everything is flowing in, in order. And also when you're a live stream, um, Penalties do stand out more. Just because you're on live stream does not mean you're free, you're absolved from penalties. That actually means you're probably more likely to occur penalties if you're going against what's going what's happening. If you're rushing a player and you're causing uh, procedural error minors or you're cursing things like that, then yes, you will rack up those penalties. They can result in game losses. They can result in DQs, whatever whatever may occur from that. It's just easier to occur because the world is watching you. You're on YouTube. You're on Twitch, wherever. Um, so live. those judges, yeah, you're live. So those judges' job is to make sure all of that stuff is in order. I have one to my right who, you know, he keeps track of the life points. So that way, when you guys are watching on YouTube and you see on the screen the life point change, that's his job. Um, the other guy's job, the other guy's job is to highlight cards. It's to highlight cards. So you know he'll, you know, you summon tour guy. He puts tour guide up on the screen, so that way you can see what this card is, what it does. Everybody thinks just because somebody is a competitive player that they know every card, but also we have players who don't know where every card is. We have people who don't play at all and don't and just watch. Um, my partner watched the live stream because I was on live stream as the judge. She doesn't even watch Yu-Gi-Oh. She doesn't play or nothing. And there's still a lot of casual. You look at these live stream numbers on YouTube alone, you get thousands of thousands. I, I don't even know what the numbers are like on Twitch. And, and that's just, and, and that's, that's why it's that's why live stream is such a big thing and you know a lot of players they don't want to be on live stream but live stream is where live stream will, will teach you how to really really be a good player because it makes you stay in lane it, it teaches you the hard it teaches you the hard rules of it and then you can adapt from there um, and a lot of players do like being on live stream because they like the notoriety um, you got a team like Team pop one, you guys are, you know, you, you make it up there and, and you start, you win and you start to get known. Yeah. That's the goal. Uh, we had to, I had the guy, um, remember, do you remember Indianapolis? Uh, yes, I was at Indianapolis. The, the guy who got exodiated. <laughs> Justin Singh. Yeah, he was on live stream the next time. And yep. you know what? The thing is, like, that's why everybody knows him. He got Exodia on live stream. And he's a great so it's player. Like, and he is. And he is. And the guy who played Exodia, and I'm sorry, I'm very bad with Jeff names. Leonard, Jeff Leonard. He played Exodia. Jeff Leonard. Jeff Leonard. Let me tell you, Jeff Leonard was a YouTube star, a YouTube and a Facebook star for, like, uh, two weeks 
when I would go on, I would go into anime groups. They would talk about, oh, there was a player who played Exodia, blah, blah, blah. Livestream gives you that notoriety. You got people who don't even play Yu-Gi-Oh, know nothing about Yu-Gi-Oh. They only seen it as a child. They're, they're talk, they were talking about it. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the space live stream allows. Mm-hmm. Yes, it sounds like it can be, it sounds like the, the penalties for it can be harsher, which they aren't technically harsher. They're just, you're just getting pointed out for them. Right. But everything you could possibly want to be like that, that famous duelist, the one that's getting your team sponsors, getting, you know, your notoriety, you becoming a, a local legend. Yeah, that's what live stream is for. That's all live stream does. It all comes from live streams. I, I can't think of any YCS has happened where when it ended, people didn't talk about, you know, how, how great uh, this play was or that play or how insane this was. Like, think about, like, uh, when Hani played uh, Jesse Cotton in the mir- Tier Mirror match, and it was just a masterful game for 55 minutes straight. And the way Hani played that was just so insane, and everyone just can't stop talking about how incredible he is. And now look at him. You know, he's traveling the world. He's getting uh, NFTs made after him. Um, it's, it's just crazy what this game can do for someone. Yes, that, that's true. That's true. Like I said, I've been working with Billy Brake for a whole year. Didn't even know that was him. Um, Chris Le- <laughs> Chris LeBlanc, who you had on your your podcast just recently, um, I didn't know who he was before Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. After Minneapolis, I started seeing him at regionals. And it was so bad. We had to start clearing people away from just his table. Like, they the head judge come over like, hey, make sure you keep all the spectators away from Chris LeBlanc's table. Because, you know, they're just going to crowd him. They're just going to crowd him. You got a couple spectators, that's fine. If you got 30 people, you got a problem. And it's only round two. Yeah, at the last regional I played at, uh, me and Blue Game and uh, Trevor, we were playing uh, table one, and there was like 25 people who were trying to watch the game, and the judge said to come over there like, yeah, y'all got to like scat, like skedaddle. It was it was so nerve-wracking. Um, would you say being a judge i know you kind of answer it but like how specifically would you say being a judge has improved your ability as a player a lot a lot it's um the the beautiful part about about uh humanity is that when we think sometimes we're not far from each other on thinking so a lot of the times as a judge i get to see as i get to see plays that look like they were good plays but i also get to see the mistakes that people make in deck building and it, it, it teaches me and I teach my players at locals, you know, um, you know, if you talk to Devin, he'll tell you, I used to treat every locals almost like it was a regionals, you know, it, it, it's like, I, I would tell those guys, like, if you want to do all that, it's only a local stuff. You could do that. At your other locals, my locals here, we, 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 the way we play, we're training. We're not just playing. We're training. We're training for regionals. We're training for YCSs and everything. If I got to wake up at 3 a.m. to drive three hours to be there at 7, and you coming with me, we're going to be there serious. We're going to get rid of all these bad habits that players be having because they just take their lax, you know, oh, it's only locals attitude. You can't. You can't take that because once you have, once you hang on to that too much and you do it too repeatedly, you're gonna start messing up when you go to the regionals and you're gonna throw yourself off and you're gonna be down bad. I used to be that. I I did that a couple times. I went to a regionals. I remember I went 03. Mm. I went 03 and I was just, I there was nothing that could bring my day back. My day was gone and it was just because I was doing bad habits. And, um, you know, being a judge will teach you some of those bad habits because you'll see players doing it all the time. And you'll just be like, wow, this is, you know, this is the same thing I do. And now I got to fault this guy for it. I got to, you know, I can't be a hypocrite on it. I got to, I got to better myself and I got to teach my guys. I got to teach my guys at locals better. And when you, when you do that, you start putting things, you start putting things into perspective and you know, I don't, I don't know how long you've been at your locals for, um, but in my locals in Clarksville, Tennessee, Frontline Games. Shout out to Frontline Games. That's where I met Devin at. We, me, I, me, my friend George, Andy, and Jaime, we started Yu-Gi-Oh there. And when we were at, um, 
wow, which YCS is that? When we were at YCS Indianapolis, mm-hmm. and I seen uh, Yamir. Yamir topped. He top. He top sixteen with the front line with the front line games hoodie on. That's that's what we're trying to get to. We we set up a community. We became better by judging and playing, and we teach that to the community there that we help create. And they pass that stuff down, and now we got top players. I love it. I love it, man. Tell me if uh, if a guy comes up to you and they're saying, "Hey, I want to be a judge." What would you say to that person? I I would tell them first. I would ask them, you know, if they have any kind of judging experience. Um, if they say no, let's say they say flat out no, I'll tell them some articles they can read. I tell them to take the RC1 test. I tell them to take the PC1 test, too. Most people don't know that there's a PC1, which is policy comprehension. Um, RC1 is ruling comprehension, and they have DC, which is like demo comprehension. You do DC. DC is for like um, New York Comic Con extravaganzas kind of thing, uh, just to kind of show people, you know, what Yu-Gi-Oh kind of is. But I would tell them, you know, go over some of the ruling articles. Make sure you know... Uh, problem solving car text. Problem solving car text is the goat of what you need to know. That's the colons, the semicolons. You know, it, it can it can teach you from there, and you have to know the differences between like that and or and then, you know, and if you do things like that. So, you know, preaching the articles to them would be a good thing. Would be one one thing I could do. Um, making sure they go over the, the policy notes is a big thing because you got to know how to give infractions. You got to know what infractions are what you got to reread and this stuff like that. So I would tell them to start there, do the RC one test. And I would also tell them, you know, if you get an opportunity, you see a region, you go to a regionals, when you go to a regionals, walk up to a head judge and just say, Hey, how can I start judging for you? You know, that's how you get your foot in the door because usually those head judges have head judge big events. Let me tell you, if you see a head judge, if you see a judge, period, he has a black shirt with red stripes, that's the head judge. If you see him at a regional, we don't give out judge shirts for judging regionals. That means he earned that head judge shirt somewhere at a YCS or a a WCQ. So, you know, getting, so he's in, I won't say you know, like an inner circle, but he's at that level to where, you know, you're, you know, you, you work a few regionals for him and he can start recommending you, you know, if you're like, Hey, you know, you, let's say you do like four regionals for him. And he's like, man, you're a good dude. Da, da, da. And you're like, well, I'm thinking about applying for, I don't know, YCS Honolulu. <laughs> YCS Honolulu. He might be like, you know what? Yeah. Just put in your application. And then when they, when they, all the applications come in, you have a solid judge that's close to the circle that knows you, you know, that could be like, hey, yeah, put him on floor. I appreciate you coming on the podcast, uh, Kyrie. Uh, for everyone listening, that was Mr. Kyrie Nock. Uh, he is a YCS judge that's been on plenty of live streams. Please check out our socials. We're on Facebook, we're on Discord, we're on Spotify. All the links can be found in the description down below. I like to thank everybody for listening to Pop One uh, podcast. So um, make sure y'all have a good holiday. Y'all stay safe and play Yu Gi Oh! Have fun. Enjoy life. I love it, man. I love it. With that being said, thank you, everyone. Have a great day.